Welcome to Your Ghana, My Ghana on Graphic Online TV. I am Dede Amano Wilkes. Today we're discussing the importance of ethical journalism in the digital age. And joining me are two distinguished guests, veteran journalist Nana Kwesi Jana Penting, author of Truth Over Speed, Journalism Manual for the Digital Age, and Ambassador Cabral Blay Amihir, former chairman of the National Media Commission. Welcome to the show, Nana Kwesi Jan Apenting and Thank Ambassador you. Cabral Blay Amihir. Before we start our conversation, let's watch this short video documentary on our topic of ethical journalism in a digital age. In today's digital age, social media have transformed the way we consume and share news. But with this shift comes new challenges for journalists and storytellers. Veteran journalist Nana Kwesi Jan Apenting's book, Truth Over Speed, Journalism Manual for the Digital Age, explores the tension between delivering news fast and delivering it truthfully. Jan Apenting stresses the need to prioritize truth, transparency, and fairness in journalism. He notes that the pursuit of clicks and shares can compromise credibility and that misinformation can spread quickly online. Throughout the book, Jan Apenting emphasizes ethical, informed, and balanced reporting that respects cultural and gender sensitivities. He highlights the role journalists can play in producing high quality content in the digital space and weighs the advantages of automation against ethical considerations. Ultimately, Jan Apenting reminds us that journalism is a calling to serve the community and that journalists have a responsibility to project marginalized voices, shed light on injustice and hold power to account. This book is a timely reminder of the importance of ethical journalism in the digital age. As Jan Apenting concludes, the world needs journalists who possess unwavering dedication, integrity and an unrelenting pursuit of truth. Together as guardians of truth and warriors for justice, we can shape a better world through the power of our words. It's a great pleasure to have you both on today because not only are you veteran journalists, but you both happen to have each served as chairman of the National Media Commission. And um, also, not only that. Not only that. You are comrades. <laughs> <laughs> comrades, sir. Comrades dedicated to the cause of truth over speed. Yeah. <laughs> so, at Nano Kwesi Jan, Apenting, you've served in, in many, many media capacities. Various, you've edited various newspapers, and um, you're also now, as it happens, you also now have the title of Apajahini of Achim Eti. Mm. And um, Ambassador Cabral Blay, comrade, <laughs> Ambassador Cabral Blay, I'm here. You've also served in various capacities. From the age of 28, you became president of the Ghana Institute of Journalism. You served in various capacities and then became ambassador, Ghana's ambassador to Sierra Leone and then Côte d'Ivoire. You've also been chairman of the Media Commission and now you're chairman of a, a company that holds power over all of us in a literal sense, the Gridco. Um, but today we're not talking about traditional chieftaincy or electricity. We're focusing on this, the, the issue of ethical journalism in this digital age. Starting with your book, Truth Over Speed, is there a reminder of the importance of ethical journalism? Would you like to share some of the key takeaways? Well, um, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for coming to the launch of the book subsequent discussions and for inviting me. And thank you for inviting me to the launch. Yeah, it was and tremendous. I should, I should thank Ambassador, uh, comrade, uh, old comrade, for also gracing the occasion, as they say. So as I said at the launch, and this is very important, that although I wrote this book maybe in the last five, six months, uh, it's been a long time writing. In other mm. words, it's informed by all my experiences, including with virus and in various capacities. And the whole idea is that we need to constantly remind ourselves that as journalists, 
our responsibilities go beyond those of maybe any other professional group or category because people make decisions based on the information we put out. And in this age when uh, everything is about speed, things change so rapidly, sometimes we forget that responsibility. Yeah. And our ethics are, are and must be anchored on that responsibility. That what we put out is not only because people want to know, but they want to know for a purpose. And so once there's any kind of distortion in the reality we are presenting, it follows that the decisions that they will make will also be distorted. Be distorted. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and it is this reminder, but above that, I know since the book was launched in almost all the um, reviews and reports, it is said it is for journalists and sometimes student journalists are added. But I think um, it is in all the uh, reviews and reports coming out, we, we emphasize the fact that this book will help us as journalists and probably student journalists and all that. But I think um, the other dimension is that it's good for the general public in, in what we normally describe as media literacy, for people to understand what's expected of journalists so that when we go astray or something, the public would also support the corrective measures that we have to undertake. Um, if you, if you know, I've had the opportunity recently to watch a lot of TV. Um, normally, I, I must confess, I watch the uh, the pay-per-view kind of TV because of the sports there and all that. Mm -hmm. But recently, away from that, I had to watch the office on free to air TV. And what the public is being fed, you know, there's, there's I, whether they like it or not, I don't know, but much of it is not what you would expect on TV. A lot of it is money changing and betting and all the rest of it. But when they don't know that probably by the standards, um, this is not what is expected because um, there, there is no um, gatekeeping. There's no, nobody's checking it and that kind of thing. So we need this to remind ourselves also of the responsibilities that are media generally, uh, to which they should be held accountable and all that. Good. Ambassador Cabral, how timely is Nana Kwesi's book? Can you share your thoughts on the state of journalism in Ghana and Africa in this, as, we, as we go on our, our digital journey? Well, this is a quite a broad question, but uh, let me begin by commenting uh, my brother and friend and comrade for this great uh, work. Um, Indeed. You know, different times call for different responses. And in this digital age of uh, uh, minefields for all of us, uh, journalists, non-journalists, citizen journalists and the public, mm. we need a guide. Mm. Uh, and this is what he has provided. And by some great coincidence, we are in the year 2024 when this uh, marvelous opus has been launched. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back to 1994. 10 years. Uh, no, that's 30 years. 30, 30 years. 30 years. Uh, yes. When I, I, as president of GGE, led the initiative to pass the very first of ethics for the association mm. and for journalists of Ghana. And since then, there has been no review or rewriting of what we produce. But a lot has happened. So what Nana has done mm. is to respond to the new media landscape. Yes. yes. And that's why I, I, I was happy to be at the, at the lunch and also to join you today to have this conversation. Um, I must confess that for the last few years, I've not been a 
a keen observer of uh, media for many good reasons. But once you live in the media space, you are bound to be affected and therefore you need to uh, make an effort to follow. And I, th I think that, uh, you know, if you look at our times, the times of Lisbohini, Kamundudu, Kufibedu and the rest, uh, the, the media impact. Mm. Um, but all the reservations that people have about Modi media, our journalists, I think they're also uh, making a very uh, fundamental contribution to the spread of information, education, and entertainment. I'm sure if you question them, they have more challenges than in our times. Mm. Yes. You know, so I'm not quick to condemn uh, uh, infractions in, in, in the system. But what this book seeks to, to do is to give us a, a wake-up call and alert that no matter the situation, you need to ground your media practice on constant education. You know, so for all these years, in, since we transited into the digital age, nobody has provided any book mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, a, as a roadmap. Mm -hmm. You know, so let's keep educating our journalists. Uh, let's keep having conversation about all the challenges and the problems that our journalists face. And it is in this regard that I believe that this book should be embraced and, and uh, in all newsrooms. And as uh, Nana said, often we think that we are just a group of uh, monopolies holding the media space. But in today's age, exactly. uh, anybody with a smartphone can report, can capture mm -hmm. events for, but they have to be guided. And that's why I, that's why I welcome this uh, remarkable book. Excellent, yes. And that's the point now. In this in this age, everybody can be a journalist. Mm. Everybody mm. is out there mm. projecting their story. Mm. Um, and that makes the competition even greater to be, as we call it, firstest with the mostest. How can we balance in this digital age? How can we ba now balance the need for truth versus speed? I think the, 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 the point he makes is uh, very valid. Mm. Um, two things that sometimes when we think about our time, so to speak, and um, compare it to today, from a quality point of view, um, we tend to think that we produced better writing, better journalism, better information management, and all that. But the challenges for that time and now are completely different. And one of them is what both of you have just said, that anybody with a smartphone or even without a smartphone can become, um, you know... A can, storyteller. Yeah, a storyteller. Mm -hmm. But do they produce journalism? Mm -hmm. Okay, That's the difference. Even okay. the term citizen, because journalism is not just a thing, it's a process. And at the heart of journalism are fact-checking, verification, and those things. Mm -hmm. So it's like anybody can provide, uh, can, can assist you with, with information about your health, but they are not doctors. Mm -hmm. So if you tell me um, I have a headache and I say, go and take paracetamol, probably it will cure you, but that doesn't make me a doctor. The process by which doctors will go through is what makes the them... The training. The, the, yeah, even, you know, the, the process of arriving at what you need, that's what makes them a doctor. Mm -hmm. So at the heart of what we do in journalism are certain steps that must always be observed. And at the heart of the verification and fact-finding is the truth, so that at the end of it, you should be able to defend it. Precisely. So increasingly, because of the tempo of the time, because of the, the is dynamics and all that, there is sometimes a great temptation to say that it's the end that matters. So I'm putting it out there. I can correct it at any time, virtually because in our time, it was difficult to correct things. So, so there was the whole thing about proofreading and about editing out and, you know, before you put something out. Yeah. Today, we know that it can be corrected. So let me put out the first take 
and I can correct it later and all that, and sometimes it never comes in. What is happening is that once people see, read, or hear something the first time, it tends to stick. And because social media is implicated in all this, either as a source or a carrier of whatever it put out there, it becomes difficult to reverse it. So simply putting something in a newspaper and saying, oh, sorry what we put on page three of yesterday, you know, uh, it's not true, sorry, we correct it, is no longer um, um, enough. It's, it's inadequate because by then it's flown into different nests and different all birds are, are carrying it all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so the warning that one precedes or should take precedence over the other, and that truth must be at the core of that process and as its end result is what we must emphasize. And this must be true of all times. And, 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 and that is that is not just an assumption, but an assertion is at the center of the reason for this book. As a matter of fact, the story associated with the title is that I did um, some training, a training session for journalists at Ho in the Volta region. Um, this was an MTN um, sponsored training thing. And many and, of these, um, these chapters, are, are, are they actually training modules? They, yes, they, yes. So, so, so yeah. in fact, um, the book's chapters are not even called chapters, chapters they are called sessions. sessions. Right. So um, the, the, the underlying assumption is that they are used like training, training and that's why they are modules. all in bullet points and all mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that day, the discussion was in turning news into news features and features. But somehow somebody asked, when I'm here and my editor calls me and says, we've heard this, why are you, you know, why is your story not here? And at that time, I'm trying to find out you know, what should I do? So that brought the discussion about truth versus speed and can we do it and go back later and all that. And that is what, in the end, I used as the title of this book. Right. Because that discussion mm -hmm. went straight to what the professional challenge is at this time. Mm -hmm. And so you are saying that it's more important to have truthful quality journalism than fast journalism. Yeah. But Ambassador Cabral, Cabral, when I interviewed for the, you for the story in the graphic today, you mentioned that not every journalist is trained in ethical, in ethics. Can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, when I made that print, I, I, I thought to highlight the fact that um, in our time, you know, uh, the crop of journalists either came from GIG, mm -hmm or for some had been trained uh, on the job. Kamen Dudu, Kofi Bedu, uh, you can mention uh, TBOT and the rest. They didn't have the benefit of formal journalism education, but they, they, they had experience and the insight uh, based on their uh, vocational experiences now, uh, today, what is the media landscape? We have about uh, f over 500 uh, regu uh, authorized FM stations. 500? Or even more. More. Is that so? Or even more. And uh, we have a, a, a large number of newspapers. Mm -hmm. You may even say that we have, a, for the first time in, in our history, we have a number of... Uh, Training institutions in in journalism, mm. you know, before it was GIG, GIG and the, Legon. Yeah, no, Legon came in the eighties. Okay, and that was for you know I I had a chance to go there when we started. We were only eight. Right. Today, if we go to Legon, the the post is about maybe about hundred and hundred plus. plus. Uh -huh. GIG used to be have an average of about uh, fifty students per per year. Today they are in their in the thousands. I see. So you cannot even argue that all those who go through former training and say that I'm a journalist because I have a diploma mm -hmm. are that uh, specialized. I um, mean, in in the original GIJ module, you spend I think six months or the first year at GIJ, and you spend about another six months 
uh, through internship at Graphic Times, GNA, GBC, in those days. So if you are producing about three, 4,000 uh, students in journalism every year, mm. in terms of placement, you can't be sure that they will have the kind of mentoring uh, that people wouldn't have to go through that process. I mean, he will tell his own story. But he, his mentorship was through uh, the late Edward Amaebo. Mm. So he became a, a, a good writer, not because he attended uh, any of these uh, schools that have been made today, but because there was serious mentorship. Uh, when I used to be the editor of uh, Independent, mm -hmm. I, I was uh, always ready to admit or employ graduates uh, irrespective of their, of their fields. And I, I will say that within one year, based on my own uh, mentorship under Jawi Chem, uh, Apia, Apia Thompson, uh, and, 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 and many more others, uh, Emi Ashon, I will be able to also nurture you to, you know, and, and the result is, is, is was evident. You know, so we have a problem with uh, training, but we're training on the job mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, you know, if you're in Accra, I, I know I, I won't mention any names, but there are a couple of radio stations or organizations in Accra who employ the best. If you take uh, some of them, they recruit their staff from the experience uh, their employees gain at a radio universe. So they make the easy transition. But go beyond Accra and go to the regions and go to the newsrooms and you'll be surprised as to who is behind the, uh, the mic. So th there's a serious uh, crisis in, in uh, this uh, transition. What do you mean you'll be surprised at who is behind the mic? Well, they don't have the kind of ethical the things that uh, uh -huh. mm. And Nama mm. is talking about mm. no respect for ethical standards. Yes, you know, no, they have not been no no, training. They, 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 they are not aware. Yes, they're, they're not, not aware. No, they're, yes. they're eloquent. Mm. Yeah, if it's uh, mm. if it's tree or airway or enzima, they are very eloquent, articulate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those are not the signposts uh -huh. for becoming a successful journalist. Okay. Right. You know, I, and I I recall that in the time of Gifty Afi as president of GJ, uh, they they were aware of this problem mm. and had a a training program with UNESCO and I think FES mm. that allowed journalists after work, you know, to learn the rudiments, you know, and some of them came out uh, tops. Mm -hmm. But today, if you are talking about 500 radio stations or more, uh, what impact can you have? And for most of the owners of media in this country, you know, they just want to, uh, why do they set up the media? maybe mm. to promote their mm. political agenda. So uh, for as long as they have somebody who can prosecute the political agenda, they are, they are okay. They don't care how many uh, bodies are harmed in the process, how many ethical violations are okay. Mm. You know, so, so you're saying it's not self-selecting because it's not the purpose is not to... To, well, uh, to to elevate society yeah. or mm, to educate yeah. or inform, but yeah. rather you're saying there's a political agenda yeah. behind this plethora. Of and, 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 and you can see that in the nature of ownership or the makeup of ownership of most of the uh, private FM stations. Mm -hmm. How come that uh, political operators are the first to get uh, uh, the mm -hmm. access to Licenses. the frequencies? Mm -hmm. I see. And mm -hmm. when you do that, they, they look around for anybody who can just go and, uh, you know, but they are good guys in them, you know, they are good stations mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in the place. Mm -hmm. Except that with this pluralistic situation, uh, we are, and we are not regulating the way you should regulate. So you have a problem. Uh -huh. And who should do that regu regulation? Well, uh, through that question to him. Oh. Who should uh, do that regulating? <laughs> through him to him. He's a... Uh, the most recent chairman of the uh, National, Media, the National Media Commission. Media Commission. That's, that's the well, um, How does in, it happen that there are so many radio stations yeah, and that the quality yeah, is deteriorating? Yeah, yes. that, that will, I think, demand a full um, yeah. program. Investigation yes, program. Yes, but right. yeah, on its own. Mm -hmm. But both of us know that the, the, the regulation um, 
situation in this country and across board, not only in the media. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have a weak regulatory environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, take our roots. Somebody needs to ensure that we all behave. Are we behaving? I drove today through yeah. Kaneshi. It's mayhem. There were police standing mm -hmm. and everybody minding their own business. Go to the provision of water. Is that, you know, is somebody checking quality like they do somewhere mm -hmm. every day, electricity. So the, the, the question of regulation is weak in this country. And in our case, because there, there used to be an old saying, almost like a joke, Huh. that doctors bury their mistakes. Lawyers jail their mistakes. But uh -huh. for, for the media, our mistakes are always <laughs> out there for everybody everyone. to read. So ours is seen, and it's because your question, the binary premise of your question itself, you know, there is um, the NCA that provides the frequency so applications for frequencies do not go to the NMC. Mm -hmm. They go to the NCA. And remember, the NCA is not an independent um, media regulator. It is an arm of the government mm -hmm. and works under the Ministry of Communication. Mm -hmm. And um, so what they do is independent of what the media uh, commission, which is supposed to be the media regulator, does. So... They, pro they give the licenses and people set up. But the regulator does not know the basis on which the licenses were provided. So when I'm watching TV and the, and the guy is sitting there all day um, enticing people to send money so he doubles that money. And I don't know if when he was applying for that license, he said he was going to use it for that purpose. I doubt it. But the media commission cannot know whether that person has the license to do what they are doing. So clearly, we need um, to, to, to have a better system. And as I'm saying, that will take uh, all day. Yeah. Let us just say, both of us <laughs> also worked within the Africa Communication Regulatory Network system. So we happen to know yeah. what happens even next door in Cote d'Ivoire. When you go to the equivalent of the NMC, it's bigger than the whole of graphic. Mm. But our NMC here uh, is a small puny thing somewhere mm. without a single television set for online, uh, for, for immediate monitoring. Of course, there's a monitoring center somewhere. I don't know what state that is in, but we don't want to go too much there. I want to pick a couple of things from what uh, Cabral said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The training. Yes. So yes. we, 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 we that's know that's the reason that, you came up with this book. That's because right. There's insufficient that's right. And training. As and I said audience. at the launch, I myself, people, most people don't know this, but by the time I was, I became editor, acting editor of graphic and editor of the mirror. Mm -hmm. I had not had any formal what journalism training. training. But I had a lot of training. On the job. On the job. Mm -hmm. Because every vacation, I worked with Ghana News Agency mm -hmm. at Tamale, where, as he said, a great. Edward Ameibo mm -hmm. was my my mentor right. mm -hmm. and told me it was going to teach me as much as once he realized I was interested in in this uh, job. And also I read a lot and a book by Harold Evans, who was the editor mm -hmm. of the Sunday Times in the UK, who led the investigation into the Talidomite baby's mm -hmm. case. His book, I've forgotten the title. I read that book and it, it caught me, gripped me into what our responsibilities are as journalists. Because he wouldn't let it go that women had been given a drug um, to do something else and in the end it produced babies with, you know. Um, it was a fertility uh, drug. Yes, it? it was a fertility drug and produced uh, children severely malformed at yes. birth and all that. Yeah. And the Sunday Times then took it up. Now, what has happened um, subsequently everywhere is that probably no media house would provide the kind of resources, even there in the UK, for them to do what the Sunday Times was able to do mm -hmm. uh, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. But it's that kind of thing that inspired me and which I think so here, you'd find that there's a session mm -hmm. for owners, mm -hmm. the responsibilities of owners, because I believe that 
it's central today to the media's performance because when the 1992 constitution uh, talks about responsibilities and all that, at the time we're thinking more about how the state was, uh, in, you know, impacting the media space because the state the state owned uh, ninety nine percent of media resources at the time the constitution was being written. Today, the state's ownership is only a, a small part of the total media landscape. So who are the owners and what are their responsibilities? Mm -hmm. So there's also some uh, uh, another session on being a provincial or regional correspondent. Yes. Because these issues came up when I was traveling around the country interacting with journalists. And somebody told me in Damongo, they've thrown us here and nobody respects what we do and all that. And I said, what? I had the best time of my life as a journalist at Tamale. Mm -hmm. Because we had access, I mean, if you are in Damongo and you are a journalist and you know what you're doing, the regional minister is ac accessible to you in a way that the Accra-based journalists cannot have access to the Accra regional minister. I mean, it's not, it's not that easy. But in the regions, you virtually determine the agenda and all that. So we went through it, and at the end of it, so yeah, I didn't, I, we hadn't realized the extent of our responsibilities and even power, what we can, what we can do. So uh, all those issues about ownership, about working, um, in, and and I'm saying this to uh, underscore the point you made about in if you go to some of the regions, especially the new regions, where in one region I wouldn't mention there were only two journalists who mm -hmm. attended the session. But they are to report, and if we take the coming elections, we are going to depend on them to give, you know, um, um, uh, information as it happens. And there are only two <coughs> of them, and neither of them has been trained formally. And so if they do not have the opportunity to know how to do things in the right way, then um, you can imagine that we will be shortchanged as a nation when it comes to information, will be deficient in that in that in that way. So um, these are the kind of experiences, as is mentioned, and as we are all talking about, yes, that have been reflected in the selection of uh, the sessions or chapters in the book. And I think that's what makes it even more valuable that a lot of it is demand led. It's come out of your sessions with your practical mm -hmm. sessions in training with journalists. Precisely. I think there's just one issue I couldn't find guidance. And I think this is going to provide a lot of guidance, not only to journalists, but people who are out there on social media, mm. as Ambassador mm. Cabral mm. said earlier. Um, there's just one, one question mm. I didn't find any guidance on here, and I'm going to put it, I'd like to sound you both out on this. Mm. Um, and that in Ghana and in Africa generally, we place great value on friendship. Mm. We become, we make friends, we become friends very easily. Mm. What does a journalist do when a source that they have quoted and published on turns around to say, I thought we were talking as friends. I did not expect you to quote me. What is your guidance on that issue? Well, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's happened to virtually everybody if you're a journalist. And, and I tend to comment... Does to, it happen more in our context than, no, than in I'm Europe? Sure, or? I'm sure you see... You know, sources actually is not covered in that way, but there is um, there is a session on sources. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh -huh. there is. And and the whole thing about the relationship between journalists and their sources is a complicated one. Mm -hmm. Trust is mm -hmm. is is central to that relationship. Sources and voices. S sources and voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's been months since I wrote. With them, so I've forgotten mm -hmm. <laughs> about sources and voices, mm -hmm. and that's the whole point that you 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 have a relationship with somebody who provides information for you. Mm -hmm. Usually, they also have a reason; they have something they want out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when it's not done professionally, it can go very uh, uh, badly for one or for both mm -hmm. of you. Mm -hmm. So, what is the right way? So if, and, and we're sitting here with the chairman of Gridco, and electricity is a major issue in this country. Mm. And we've been friends for like 50 years. Mm. So if I go to Cabral 
and we are discussing things about the power sector. He is a major player. He's the yeah. chairman of Gridco for crying out That's loud. That's a great example. Yes. So when he gives me what he tells me, yeah. would I be right to write it in my weekly column in the Mirror without first letting him know that we are not in uh, Cabral and Jan mood, but we are in journalist or columnist and chairman mood. So the right thing at all times is to let the source know that you are going to use the information professionally. And that, perhaps that is not. Uh, that, that example can't arise because you've been friends for so long. It shouldn't yeah, arise. Yeah, very... yeah, it can arise. Okay. It can arise very easily. In fact, I was telling somebody something today about somebody I spoke with who actually heard me mm -hmm. on the phone mm -hmm. and used the information. Okay. He heard me speaking out to somebody mm -hmm. who it came back to me and mm -hmm. said, you say it's so and so. So it's even more important when the person is your friend. Because that is when, you know, if I went That's to the chairman, exactly, if I went to the chairman of Gritco and it wasn't Cabral, then I'd have to go through a whole process. But because I can virtually just knock on the door or even not knock and enter and say, hey, uh, bro, is this, that, I we have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And then next week I, in my column, mm -hmm. I'm quoting him. And he mm -hmm. comes around and says, well, I didn't know this was for publication. I also say, but you know, I'm a columnist. Why else would I discuss this with you? Yeah. Then it becomes a contentious issue. Mm -hmm. But if right at the beginning, mm -hmm. I were to let him know that, you know, I'm, I'm using this information. It may just, we may not have started off as an, as an interview, but something crops up and I find it interesting. Say, Do we know? Does the public know this? Tell I want to use this in my say, no, 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 you know, this has not come out or this and that. And if I still wanted to use it as a professional journalist, I can do it and use different attribution because I'll have to verify what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. In a column, a personal column, I may write it straight, but actually you are required, as I indicate here, to do verification so you have never used one source. Mm -hmm. It's Multiple a rule of sources. thumb that we have to all adhere Aim to for at as, least as three general. sources. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and so, unless there's reason to use subterfuge, that is, to hide your cameras and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing, mm -hmm. and there are rules there too. And what, would reason, what reason would that be? Well, if, for example, lives were at risk mm -hmm. in a situation where we need to get information but nobody, but they are concealing. You see, well, first of all, if you went to your editor and said, I suspect that um, somebody is poisoning um, the water. Mm -hmm. And why would that uh -huh. be? Because instead of buying uh, this, they are buying that. And it could probably come from somebody working in the system. So want to protect the whistleblower. Uh, that is something else that we need to know how to do, and I mm -hmm. think it's covered somewhere. Mm -hmm. If not, yes. it will be a different that one is covered. It's, yes. it's covered. It's mm -hmm. So then you establish, first of all, with the authority that you have, your editor, whoever, that there's a reason why you may not have the information you want, even with the um, uh, laws that we have now on, um, uh, how do we call it, the uh, right to information and all that, mm -hmm. even with all that, when you know none of it will produce the information you want and you have to go underground, so to speak, there to their rules. So when lives are at risk, mm -hmm. when you suspect that there's massive corruption or any corruption that mm -hmm. and there's a cover-up... Oh, the public interest. The public interest then becomes the overriding justification. If the public interest overrides even the risks that you should be taking, because there are some risks to you and to other people's reputation if anything goes wrong. Because you cannot tell up an issue from the beginning that what you are alleging is right. And so if in the process of gathering that information it comes out that this is what you suspect, 
you might be damaging people's reputation with no justification, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. except that the public interest justifies it. Mm -hmm. And and that is, and even there, there are rules. So to recap this, when somebody has information, a person is your friend, now friendships. I was actually thinking more about someone you've just met, but we become friends yeah, very easily. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. If you've just you've met, met someone, maybe you've met in a professional capacity. Yeah, if you've just met somebody or you knew the person 50 years ago, it oh, makes no difference. Okay. You Continue. must treat the process mm -hmm. in the same way. And the process may be long, it may be short, but it consists of letting the person know because they are rights. They have rights. Mm -hmm. yes. And so in the use of sources in all situations are covered by all the rules of human engagement, confidentiality, copyright, um, whatever situation it may be, you are using their material, you are quoting them, uh, word of mouth, whatever. You should let them know that this is a professional <coughs> operation. You are going to use it uh, for uh, publication. And uh, if you do not do that, and, and why now we hear more of people saying, I didn't say that, mm -hmm. and then they produce um, a recording, and they are shocked because people are recorded without their knowledge. Uh -huh. Right. And and especially in our feverish political atmosphere, mm -hmm. it's taken as proof that okay, yeah, I have a recording. Uh -huh. And so bring the recording, they play it, and they're recording in me, you know, and then we think that is sufficient. Mm -hmm. Actually it isn't mm -hmm. because it's not fair. And sometimes when uh, people are questioned in the morning and they say, Oh, you've been quoted in the graphic or in the Times or somewhere, they've not even seen the paper. Probably they've not, you know. So um, in in your interview with Cabral in your column, yes, uh, he speaks about uh, the the uh, dangers of becoming the used an expression man bites man, dog man man, man, man bites, bites dog. dog you know? Yes, <laughs> the, yes. We the classic are, the, journalism the classic example, example, journalism yes, training example. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and even a seasoned and experienced journalist as himself is mm -hmm. wary of you know yes. being misquoted. Yes. And they're looking for the slightest thing because mm -hmm. of, of the competition. Yeah. So yeah. the slightest thing can be, you know, uh, uh, twisted and all that. But And so the, the thing is, we should remember where we started from, mm -hmm. that the information we are putting out has a purpose mm -hmm. and that we are not doing this as an end in itself. If it were, then it would be, uh, okay, just put it out. But you want the information to be useful. To improve society. And to improve society. And mm -hmm. to do all that, it is right that we use a fair means, I'm sure. Cabral, yes, brother. do you have any experiences uh, in that area? Well, I, I, if you permit me, I would want to ask uh, your original question yes. uh, with, with uh, an example from my experience. And yes, I think please. here, you're talking about sources, verification, mm -hmm. and judgment. And mm -hmm. uh, flashback, I recall many years back when I was an editor, we had a, I had a source, credible source, mm -hmm. an insider mm -hmm. in the NDC, uh, NCP. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's the time when we had an alliance of mm -hmm. the NDC yes. and ACAS uh, vice presidency. And this source came to me after one of their meetings and said that at the executive meeting, uh, Rawlings had promised, has, had declared he, he was going to destroy the Nkrumah Mausoleum. Mm -hmm. That was, it was, it was a huge- The uh, Nkrumah Mausoleum. Yes, uh -huh. that this at their, Executive meeting, that's what uh, Rawlings, uh, the late Rawlings, uh, uh, wanted to do. So after the meeting, he, he, he gave me the story. And first to publish. So, we, you know, and those were the days that if you use a story like that, you, you know, you... Fastest with the most. You, you sell. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So we did a story. We were convinced because he was a, a very credible source. But in, in, the, in the middle of the night, I reflected on, on the story and asked myself, one, how sure are you about uh, the, the story or the, the statement from your, your source? Because you're relying on a single source. source. Uh -huh. And if you came out with a story, mm. of course, as, as a, a professional journalist, you could not disclose your, your source. source. Mm -hmm. So how would you confidently say that this could be the reflection of the, of the meeting? Mm. We had gone to bed, you know, printed. Mm -hmm. But about, you know, those days we, we did a manual counting mm -hmm. or a sum of the pages, 12 pages. Right. So in the middle of the night, I, I someone said, I know this cannot be a good story. You'll be in trouble if this story comes out. I was a president of GGA. Mm -hmm. So I have to protect the integrity uh, of your institution. Yes. So I, I rise to Dan Suman. I, I then lived in Nima. I rise to uh, Dan Suman and shared my fears with uh, a Jubilee as I was a reporter. And we came to the conclusion that this story cannot run, cannot fly. Mm -hmm. So we actually went and ordered that the, the front page should be destroyed. Moved. Somehow, some of the uh, compilers, mm -hmm. they, you know, it, it happens. They stole some and sent it. So it was in the, the next day it was uh, in the market. But we had taken the decision to stop the publication. Mm -hmm. I remember those the CCC came out uh, to do a press conference attacking me as G.J. president doing such a, a story. And of course, it, it makes sense to doubt the story in the sense that it was Rawlings who built the mausoleum. That's yes. what I was wondering when you said it. You know, yeah. so if mm. because somebody you trusted gave you that story, you had to do other checks. So at the, at the, at the cost mm -hmm. of reprinting, mm -hmm. we, we did the writing. Yes. Because we had not done uh, all the processes that uh, Nana had, has uh, elaborated. Mm -hmm. Independent sources, verification, and serious analysis about the story you're doing, the import. Mm -hmm. you know, so we, you know, we lost money, uh, uh, but we did the writing. Mm -hmm. you know, so the, the import of what I'm saying and what he has said mm -hmm. is that friendship doesn't mean anything when it comes to your professional judgment. Mm -hmm. You have to go through the the all the, the rigorous process. Yes, you know. Of fact and, checking. And and so that's why we didn't do it. So we had to pay the price. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you both very much for that. Well, Nana Kwesi, you end your book with some very stirring words that make us all proud to be journalists. <laughs> the last chapter is called, or the session, A Journey of Truth, Learning and Serving the Community. And you emphasize the role of the journalist in um, not only um, providing truth, but also making society a better place. And you, you, end, you say the world needs journalists who possess, who possess unwavering dedication, integrity, and an unrelenting pursuit of truth. The future of journalism lies in our ability to adapt, learn, and serve our communities. Let's embrace this challenge. And you end saying, together as guardians of truth and warriors for justice, we can shape a better world through the power of our words. I remember writing that around midnight, so I must have been tired. It's <laughs> so. very inspiring. It's very inspiring. And um, I wonder, you, you must have been tired, but do you still believe in the power of the pen? Yeah. Ambassador, you too. Mm. Given all your experiences, do you believe in the power of the, of the pen to change our society in Ghana and Africa? For the for the better. Well, in the beginning was the word, mm -hmm. and to always remain with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, much as I'm no more a journalist, uh, I, I recall in 1991, I wrote a letter to Kukubako, uh, and it was to say that Ghana seeking democrat uh, freedom or independence will come through the word. And uh, lo and behold, when 
democracy was restored in 1992, it had taken the, the sacrifice, the toil of uh, journalists mm -hmm. at great risk to their, to their lives. The mm -hmm. Tommy Thompson's, Kubli News, mm -hmm. Makai Jays, to reach uh, that day. Chrissy Pratt and the rest all suffered. Kukubaku was incarcerated. I went to, I was in exile for 15 yes, years. Yes, yes. You, know, you never mentioned it. I was there for 15 years yes. in exile. <laughs> so I, when I do a review, I'll, I'll mention it. Mention it now. Yeah, so <laughs> what it means is that in the beginning, you were with a struggle. And it, it, it dates to the independence struggle, uh, where even non-journalists had to use the vehicle of journalism mm -hmm. uh, to attain independence for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and even, you know, even in today's uh, dispensation, the Fourth Republic, with all the reservations that you may have about the role of the media, uh, their vigilance has kept us on steady course. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of nobility about the media profession. Uh, I don't know what inspires people to become journalists these days, but when we took the decision to become journalists, mm -hmm. we, we saw ourselves as missionaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there were other attractions, but we took that painful part. And as we sit here today, I think we, are, we should be proud that we made a difference. And I want to ask this generation of journalists that uh, no matter what you do, uh, you'll be judged by history. Yeah. So if in 30 years, 50 years time, your contribution is assessed as being positive and impacting and changing society for the better, then you, you, you end the place in our history. Absolutely. Uh, if it is just to uh, acquire uh, the, an opulent life, which many in Ghana aspire towards, that's another story. But I think for, for our generation, and I'm sure there are people in this generation who are also so inspired, you know, we thought that we could impact our world uh, through, the, through uh, the profession. And Nana Kwesi, what do you say to that? Well, what can you say is absolutely right. Um, sometimes when we think about what is happening now, you're tempted to think, was it worth it? Or is it worth it? Mm -hmm. We are still in it. And absolutely it is because um, we are impacting uh, lives every day. First, by simply providing information is, is the DNA. Of, of life. Without that, um, you know, people don't realize that, for example, in, in, in the UK, in the BBC, it's because of the BBC that people got to know time. Be because time, time yes. Oh. Yeah, the yeah. When, when in all their broadcasts, the time is six o'clock, it's 12 o'clock, is this. Mm -hmm. And now we take it for granted. And if you think about it, in a place like Kumasi, we know that at 12 noon, the, the cannon that the, was installed after the Yasantra war mm -hmm. would boom. And that's why they say Prem Tubre, which is the, now the Akan expression for 12 noon. I'm saying this to say, our impacts are so varied and so, so all over the place that you might not even think that something like the BBC's legacy in UK society or British society is time. Because of that, people got to know time became part of the structure, mm -hmm. exact time. Mm -hmm. And so what we do every day, when, uh, when we're, you know, uh, editors, we used to say, if at the end of the day, the man in the trotro says, the woman in the trotro says, have you heard this? I read it in the graphic, graphic, then you know you are making an impact. Mm -hmm. So today, on that level alone, but there's the deeper one of holding the people in power to account. It's happening all the time in our editorial comments, in the panel discussions offered by the media and all that. There are still people who, um, the, the, the gentleman who won the Journalist of the Year Award um, going doing stories on Galamsey, 
Mm-hmm. You also won the best uh, journalist award. That's for mm-hmm. the the um, uh, mining sector. He he does tremendous things at his risk. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he's chased away by 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 armed um, gangs and all that. Mm-hmm. But he's still doing it because it is only through his lenses Mm -hmm. that we get to see the destruction of our waterways Mm -hmm. and what's happening to our land and and, and the frightening future that this Galamsey thing is posing. Mm -hmm. Um, Even at his age today, uh, Cameron Dudu writes about this relentlessly Mm -hmm. every week. Mm -hmm. So what drives him? What drives a man, you know, in his 80s to feel so passionate and with his writing so fresh, it's something that can never be taken away from him. Mm. And I think for many of us, and I'm sure, as Cabral said, there are many in this generation who are feeling the same. Unfortunately, the the danger and therefore the need for these reminders in this form, and I'm sure all our experiences, my advice is we should all be writing and putting these examples down so that mm. people can be guided. Yes. Uh, the need for this is greater because in our time, the mentors were identified. We had radio, GBC, with two stations, one TV station, a, a couple of newspapers and all that. And the good ones you knew and you could. When I joined Graphic, there was a gentleman called Each as Asante. And he was uh, to train me. And, you know, uh, the late Charles Asante, I always remember when he told me, hey, you know, you are now my, my people, more or less. So they were willing to, to, to train us. Do we have, today you have nearly 700 radio stations. 700. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the latest uh, right, figure yeah. I have. Mm. Who's training all those people? In what ways are we giving them the kind of uh, ethical, grounding. you know, mm-hmm. you know, the, the 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 kind of inspiring words we just heard from here? So we have a lot of work to do. Mm-hmm. It's enjoyable work, and it's all that we have done and will continue to do. And so uh, the opportunity to be a journalist is a privilege. Uh, to be in a situation where People wait on your word and act on it. And when we, once we remember that responsibility, I believe that it should guide us to do what is right. Well, Indeed. And if you may allow me to just say a, a few ways. I yeah, think that yeah. the beauty of journalism is that it prepares you for any task in life. Mm. You know, so I started as a journalist, uh, made a transition to diplomacy. Yeah. And if today, I'm in charge of the National Transportation Company. Uh, I must be using my groundings in journalism to to make an impact. Indeed, indeed, that's wonderful. Often we like to bring this program to a close with a, a musical interlude or a poetry interlude, mm-hmm. but we didn't need to bring in a poet today because Nanakwesi has revealed himself in his dedication as a poet and we would like him to, to read out his dedication at the beginning of this book. <laughs> so dedication to the journey, past, present, and future. Past, the portal that leads us to your, where tales of triumph and heartache bore. Present, the vessel where moments reside, where dreams unfurl, and passions collide. Future, the vault of untrodden beats, a realm of hope teeming with dreams. So to my MTN comms team, there's more to come. To all who labor under the yoke of the pen, Nana KG, February 2024. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much for sharing this, these rich experiences with us today. It's been truly wonderful. And thank you for all the, the journalists, past and present, that you've mentioned, including latterly Cameron Dodo at his, at his stage in life, still contributing to the debates, these really important debates. 
Um, let's continue now the discussion on our social media channels and we look forward to discussing other issues with you here in the studio in future. Thank you, gentlemen, very thank much. You. Thank you. And thank you all too for joining us for this conversation on ethical journalism in the digital age. My guests today have been Nana Kwesi Jan Apenting and Ambassador Cabral Blay Ami here. And I am Dede Amano Wilkes. Don't forget to subscribe and join us next time on Graphic Online TV for more thought provoking Your Ghana, My Ghana conversations. Bye for now. Thank you.